Good day all. It's been a while. We finally have now some more casting work coming in the next couple of weeks. To start, I partook in an interview by the Auris Press to explain a little bit about agriculture and the idea of the no self in a shortish interview. I think we went for about an hour. Uh, we left a lot on the table. Um, I did this at five o'clock in the morning, so my brain wasn't quite straight and he was up quite late. Um, so it wasn't a bad introduction to some of the principles of biodynamic agriculture, regenerative agriculture, uh, the notion of the no self, and of course, something of interest, I think, the notion of the holo biont, um, which is something that has vast and important implications for the world. And is something probably a little bit different uh, that not many people would have heard of, but it's one of the more important things, I think. Um, as time goes on and more evidence comes out about it, uh, we'll slowly realize the implications of not looking after the soil. So, hope you enjoy. Uh, look out for some more recordings coming soon. We have some interesting material coming up. Until next time. It is recording, yeah. Uh, today I'm going to talk to Ship of Fools cast about biodynamics, regener regenerative agriculture. <laughs> I'm tripping over my words there. Yeah. Uh, more or less, and, uh, and Rudolf Steiner, and things like this. And he's very knowledgeable in this, I think. I didn't even really know hardly anything about it until I saw one of his own podcasts with somebody else. So, I mean, I, I knew a bit about Steiner, but I didn't know the details of his agriculture stuff, which is quite uh, interesting and I think uh, correct. And uh, so I thought we should talk about that. And he's down in Australia, which is a very strange place. And he was just telling me how it's very strange. Hmm. And I believe it is very strange. Whenever I think of Australia, I just think of Mad Max. I don't really think of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's cliche, probably, but I mean, yeah, what a great, it's, it's quite a cliche, great movie. Quite cliche, I would say, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not like that at all. You're not going around your bike on the on the open roads. And... No, no, we don't. Unfortunately, women, yeah. unfortunately, oh, I'd, right. I'd kind of like that actually. If we if we were doing that, but um, mm -hmm. actually, when you when you originally asked me that question, um, I, I went surfing uh, that day, and I, I was sitting there in the crystal clear waters uh, underneath me in a very temperate winter. I think it was about twenty degrees um, Celsius. Yep. That is, oh. and I, I was just thinking, you know. Um, why am I Australian? That's a good question. <laughs> and and all, all I could think was it's some, you know, terrible cosmic retribution um, for my Irish ancestry. That's all I can think. And I was being severely punished um, by, by, yeah, it sounds punishing. All right. Surfing, surfing in the, in the, in the warm climate. And uh, yeah, it sounds terrible. C completely know. awful. Um, you know, <laughs> gazing on thousands of miles of wide sand beaches with, with no one on them. So yeah, mm -hmm. just terrible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrible. And here it's like, here it's the middle of summer and well, not middle of summer, but like it's supposed to be warm and it's of course cloudy and yeah. raining. Yeah. So sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so as well, I always say to people, don't, don't come here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a weird place. I can't. I can never get my mind around it or how it how it is. Yeah. And I think you you even hinted that you can barely as well. It's one of these sort of open landscape places that's just like, oh, what am I? Where am I? And it's weird. And like you know, so many things can kill you and all that. But uh, I mean, everyone knows this. I guess we shouldn't prattle on about it. Hmm. Hmm. Deadly, sure. deadly spiders, deadly snakes. Do you ever get bitten by a snake or a spider? <laughs> um, I, I never have. Uh, okay. My my uncle actually got bitten by a, a snake called a Great Southern Taipan which is um, the second most poisonous uh, snake on the planet, I think. And somehow he survived that. Yeah. But oh, wow. his hair turned white and he went blind, but he survived. <laughs> so uh, people do wow. get bitten, but I've been fortunate so far. I have not. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a good rugged manly place where you can, you know, wrestle with saltwater crocodiles and things. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah absolutely. I we mean, all, it we, all do that. we all do that. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing. When I go back to Canada, the first thing I notice, this is going to sound harsh now. I'll try to say it in a non-harsh way, yeah, but sure, is that like, sure. I think people look kind of physically, how do I say it? How can I say this? Uh, I, I notice well, as soon as I get off the plane that people look kind of physically different. I think it's from getting more sunlight generally or something mm -hmm. like that. They don't get that much sun here. You notice when you're here, just, there's a great, you know, paleness, which is fine. I mean, there's no problem with that, but it's kind of, it's not just that. It's kind of a physical difference, slight 
I was going to say deformities, but more like um, <laughs> right. slight, slight. Um, I think just from not getting as much sunlight. I think when you get more sunlight like that, you get a sort of larger, more, more comely, better formed human <laughs> specimen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this might be my bias, and yeah. maybe I'm talking about this, but I, I've, I felt I've noticed this. Not to offend any Irish people. I mean, I'm I'm Irish. I'm living in Ireland, so fuck off. Don't bother. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I mean, on on the other hand, you can get too much sun, and it can kill you. Um, <laughs> like yeah. like here, it's yeah. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's like the sun is about a kilometer away. That's what it feels like. It's unbelievable <laughs> in summer, and you just want yeah. to die. Um, so you know, it's a happy medium, I think. Um, but right. Right. yeah, no, I, yeah. I generally agree. Um, you know, people that have a lot of sun. Uh, spend a lot of time outdoors for sure there's some difference uh, in the phenotype shall we say yeah it does it, it affects the growth of the human i think and even having the the broader landscapes the open uh, vistas of uh, like canada and australia you have like you know as much space as you want basically yeah i think it makes yeah. a, a larger boned specimen or something or yeah yeah it, people i can notice these this physiognomy uh from lo location a little bit anyways yeah. but and that's another thing if we're going to talk about biodynamics like australia in terms of farming i don't even know is it remotely similar? You got these weird fucking baobabs and kangaroos and shit. Like, is it like, can you like farm turnips and carrots, like carrots and, or do you have to grow like weird exotic, like, I don't know, Japanese, uh, you know, what's the horseradish stuff they use? Wasabi or like, you know, is it like, mm. is it like normal farming kind of? Let me um, just say, ask that <clears throat> off the bat. Yeah, normal farming, um, normal, Descending. normal vegetables. <laughs> yeah, we, we pretty much just have a European <laughs> diet. There's nothing too exotic here and maybe with the asian population that have moved here recently you get yeah. like probably a greater variety of various asian vegetables and stuff like that but overall it's the same three veg and meat um anglo kind of diet that the diaspora has you know anywhere they right. went so not right. nothing particularly creative but um i think as we'll see um, with biodynamic agriculture um it actually developed here in a big way probably more than anywhere else. And I think really? I put that down to, yeah, surprisingly. Um, and I, I put that down to the fact that our soil is terrible, um, absolutely terrible. Is we it? have topsoil, barely any, um, barely any like really good agricultural land. And um, okay. as a result, I think the farmers that do biodynamic farming have had to adapt um, significantly to the landscape. And uh, so there is there is a lot of creative agriculture going on here, um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. to be honest, um, when I when I when I found that out, I was somewhat surprised. Um, obviously, we have the big monocultural setups, so big big crops, big cropping, and stuff like that, yeah. um, where they just pump uh, fertilizers into terrible soils <clears throat> because that soil, yeah, as I yeah. said, is bad. Um, yeah. And of course, another thing here is water management, which is a huge thing because we have you know bugger right. bugger all water, like hardly any. So, um, yeah, all these elements um, have kind of led to uh, creative farmers, I would say, actually, right. because they have, to, oh, cool. they have to be creative to to make it work um, as a right. future. Yeah. So it's because that, it's not because of a proliferation of the Waldorf schools or something? Or... No, no, I don't, I don't think so, no. I think it was really yeah. just by necessity, um, to be honest. Right. Yeah. No, that's cool. No, that's yeah. so you're, it's, it's uh, once again, just a unique place with a unique uh, Mad Maxian view. So let's, we should start off by explaining then, because a lot of people don't even know. What, I, I mean, I barely knew what it was. So yeah. regenerative, regenerative agriculture, let's, can you tell us what it is and uh, the reasons and purpose of it? Let's start with that. Let's start with that. Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, I think like I've got a really good quote that I like to start off with. And um, this is, I, I forget who said it, but basically he, the way he described um, uh, agriculture agricultural systems was that they are prone to expon exponential decay or exponential regeneration. And that's the way he described it. And um, in general, uh, regenerative agriculture realizes and, and it seeks to tilt things towards exponential regeneration. And biodynamic agriculture in particular uh, falls under this uh, umbrella, I guess. So um, I think the best way to understand what exponential regeneration is, is perhaps maybe to talk about what exponential decay entails um, in agricultural systems, um, if, if you want to go through that. Um, sure. I think a, a big thing for regenerative agriculture is soil and soil degradation. That is pretty much forms the basis of the, the entire thing. 
And, you know, I often see all these people talk about climate change and overpopulation and everything else like this as civilizationally threatening events. Um, but I, I really, weirdly enough, and I don't know if it's the same for you, but I never hear about soil retrogression or degradation. Yeah, rarely, rarely. But I'm not hearing Varg, Varg and some guys talk about it, like, you know, yeah, 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 obscure Varg, people. Varg, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you may have done, actually. I think I may have seen that video. But um, for sure, like it's it's a massive problem. It's a huge problem, and whether or not you believe in civilization or not, um, you know, it's it's not really the point. But in, in my opinion, it's pretty much the most catastrophic scenario we face. Um, yeah. Just just as a statistic to put it into context, um, I think we're losing annually. The last um, time I read was twenty four billion tons of fertile soil a year due to erosion worldwide, which works out to be about three point four tons every year per person on the planet so right. it's insane like it's not sustainable yeah, yeah. in any way um the other question of course is the fertilizer question so fertilizers are a necessary part of mass agriculture because the soil is destroyed so the only way you can do a huge crop is to use a ton of fertilizer um one thing people don't understand about fertilizer is to make a metric ton of fertilizer, you require basically a metric ton of oil to do this. So it's an extremely oil intensive um, industry. Uh, some use natural gas, but typically it's oil that, that gets used. So um, to synthesize uh, fertilizers, you need several ingredients. You need ammonia, you need something called uh, phosphoric acid. And then you need something called uh, triple superphosphate. And in triple superphosphate, they have um, sulfur. And the way that they get sulfur is they extract that from oil or natural gas. So that's why, why you must have oil to make fertilizer or natural gas or some kind of fossil fuel that you can extract uh, sulfur from, right? Okay. Um, so to make matters worse, um, of course, you need to transport the raw materials to the fertilizer factory uh, by ship. Usually you've got to ship yep. the fertilizer out, blah, blah, blah. And you can see that you're, you're building up this use of uh, resources. It's very intensive. Uh, yep. On top of that, of all the, the ferts used around the world, I think about 36 million tons go to waste. Um, they get washed off the farm. They go into water resources. You get issues to do with eutrophication, which is the pollution of water resources. You have biodiversity loss. And, you know, you can think all the other impacts that come along with this, that with fertilizer yeah. going into, into systems. Yeah. Um, so over time, you can see how, like, this kind of situation leads to something that you would classify as exponential decay. Um, and, yep. yeah, so this is one of the things that... Um, regenerative agriculture seeks to reverse it's you're seeking to reverse this impact on the natural environment um, right. the, the problem is as i see it is regenerative agriculture um is not as economically viable so people want cheap food they don't really care about the quality so um, they've developed these large-scale agricultural economic models and supply chains basically to ensure that they get cheap food and yeah this is one of the, the problems that farmers wrestle with, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The factory farm, the Walmartism, the just give them the give them the most expedient. Yeah, hundred percent. Keep and keep it keep it turning over. Absolutely. So, in Australia's case, it's different because, as you're saying, the soil was already is the soil was already ruined. So it's slightly different. So you guys already started out with a slightly more healthy view because you could see the end result. Is that? Uh, no, I think, well, I, I think that, yeah, that there are more people that are open to it, uh, put it that way. We, right. we still have monoculture. So we have huge cane farms, say, uh, up north, um, mm -hmm. in Queensland, which is, mm -hmm. which has had an impact on, on the barrier reef to some degree, because all the fertilizers wash off into the, into uh -huh. the rivers and go onto the reef and it gets kind of ruined, right. but arguably, I don't know the, the extent of that, but it is a problem. Mm -hmm. So we definitely have that. But on the other hand, because um, a lot of farms go under quickly because the soil gets ruined, uh, by necessity, yeah. the farmers definitely are willing to investigate other other options, I think. Right. Which is why and, uh, uh, biodynamics has become as prominent as it has uh, in Australia. So, yeah, yeah, so in bi biodynamics, it does it not, the main, um, the main um, solution is cow manure, yes? Or am I wrong? 
or sorry say that again the main uh, the, one of the main solutions to this is a cow manure yeah to use that yeah. um yeah, yeah we, we can go into that maybe a little bit later um okay great, specifically yeah. how that works but yeah cow manure yeah. is a big thing and and they have these things called um preparations and they use these preparations to uh build the soil um effectively but yeah I think in general, in regenerative agriculture, um, that's basically what they seek to do as well. They, they just go, go about it a little bit differently. But um, there's a guy on YouTube. Um, his name's Richard Perkins. <clears throat> pardon me. Mm -hmm. okay. And he's a farmer. Um, he, has, he has a great channel. He has a farm in Sweden, I think. And he integrates uh, regenerative agriculture and also biodynamics, but not, not so much biodynamics, but he basically has a, a regenerative uh, venture. And I recommend everyone go and check out his channel. There's a ton of resources on there. And he does really, really excellent videos. Um, okay. But uh, he described uh, regenerative agriculture really well. And the way he described it was, um, and I quote, if you look at nature, I see everything is looking after its own needs in the service of all. Everything is patented to be a benefit to the whole, but not without taking care of its own needs first. The deeper I study ecology and the patterns and relationships in the natural world around me, the more glaringly obvious it becomes that this is the default setting of all life. Uh, mm. That's the end of that quote. Yeah. And that, that yeah. really sums it up, man. That's exactly what they're yeah. going for yeah. in general. Yeah. yeah, these are sort of conclusions I reached on my own by like doing my own gardening here. Yeah. Yeah. Just I know it sounds stupid, not, not to that uh, profound degree where I would say something so eloquently, but more mm. or less what this is what I would think myself just from noticing how certain things grow over here and grow over there and doing my own compost and uh, the way things want to grow in certain areas. And then how just the, that what you're saying, how it relates to everything. Like it's very local. It's my garden. It's may maybe similar to the other gardens in the neighborhood or whatever, hmm. but it is unique in that way. And the interrelation between other things, you know, there's give and take and you may lose a crop of this one year to start to a carrot fly or this and that. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. you like try to do what the factory farmers do, which is to insure a crop of carrots every year by any means necessary, then you destroy those interrelations. And this is the, uh, this is more or less what he's saying. I would say, like, what this is what they're doing that is ruinous is that they by ensuring that, um, you know, by by through chemicals, fertilizer, and all these other means, and they're not only destroying the soil, but the interrelations are gone. The food itself is losing its nutrition as well as, as well as, as well as the soil, so it's not even as healthy for you. So, I mean, taking all those into account is the, well, we, I guess what you would call biodynamic, bi biodynamics. Maybe we should uh, explain that as well then. Should we get into that or? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, just quickly on that, and, and you make some really excellent points. Um, the, the way Richard describes everything is, you know, he, he describes it as effectively the holistic management of the earth, <clears throat> mimicking the ecosystem. And then when you yeah. model out your enterprises, you try to use locally procured inputs and outputs um, and in many ways, you can think about the political implications of this. Like I notice a lot of people on Twitter talking about, you know, we've got to do this politically, you've got to do that, blah, blah, blah. But something that's so fundamental as growing food locally, uh, using local yeah. inputs. And you can imagine reducing your reliance on technology and global supply chains is a huge thing that um, yeah. localist agriculture, you know, helps. But um, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's a huge thing and and working within those systems is how people probably need to start thinking about food production as far as i can yeah tell. No, let, yeah. let alone the, the tastiness of the food is uh, as well. not just uh, not just tastiness but the uh the health benefits of the food and everything like that what's uh what do they call it what is uh that michael sharon calls it first um first things like getting back to first things which is from i forget where he gets that from mm. The, you know, the important, the, like knowing and understanding food and wh where your food is coming from, or like, you know, husbanding it yourself. Yeah. yeah. Like being, having that relation right directly to the thing and, and taking it of, and I believe that's also Steiner's philosophy is that it, it is of utmost importance, uh, agriculture. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. He's, he yeah. spoke about, um, food production, like, you know, in terms of being a cultural and communitarian thing to do. Right. So, um, he, he saw it as as um you know the bad element being um doing things mechanistic feeding something as a mechanistic unit to feed mechanistic units um yeah or uh, the alternative that he gave was you know shepherding the earth enhancing the earth and 
uh, by extension, enhancing human culture. Um, and yeah. it's a yeah. huge thing that we've obviously gotten away from in a big way. And I even, like how even in his time, right? Even in his time, uh, things yeah. were starting to go that way in a big way. Well, he started in the he started writing about this in the twenties, was it? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Nineteen twenty four yeah. is when he did his his lectures, his agricultural lectures. But um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe he was inspired by in the first uh, was it the first World War when Germany before they when Germany was um what do you call it not blockaded but when they um but they won't they won't let shipping in and out or whatever and they were out of nitrates for their for their fertilizer. And they discovered a new way to get nitrates out of the air or something like that. And he, this set him on the path of thinking about this and the importance of this hmm. is what hmm. I read. Maybe you know more about that than I do. No, I wasn't aware of that, actually. Yeah, oh, but that, yeah. that would make yeah. sense. It would make perfect sense. He did do it after World War Two. Oh, sorry, World War One. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it would make sense. Uh, as far as I know, he did write it in 1924. But, you know, it could yeah. have yeah. well and truly have been underway in his mind prior to that. Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I believe he did a lot of lecturing, too. And a lot of them, a lot of his lectures are lost. He didn't write them down. He just would give like amazing talks and we don't yeah. have them. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, it is sad. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, we, we've lost. And uh, of, yeah. what do you what do you think of his theories about it being related to cosmology, the sun? Uh, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and all that. Um, you... It's a funny one, you know. It's a funny one. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how I, how I feel about it, but but I, I will say this: like uh, everyone I've spoken to, um, local yeah. farmers around here, um, people I've interviewed on the podcast, they all swear by it. Do they? Um, yeah, they do. Um, so yeah, cool. yeah. I, I would. Uh, I think it's great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. People that are listening, maybe they they don't know, but. Um, you know, effectively biodynamic growers, uh, they have sowing charts and the way that they sow um, plants or seeds is by the moon and the stars, constellations and the position of the moon. And uh, yep. this forms the basis of how they, they manage their growing, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. But <laughs> but they, they yeah. say it works, you know, and uh, yeah. who am I to argue with that? I'm just some guy in a, in a city. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to believe them every time. But you um, haven't tried. Uh, you haven't tried a bit agri. You're you're really into it. I, I thought you would have been. Um, are you studying agriculture or anything like that? Or? No, I'm not not studying. It's just a personal interest. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I, I just feel like it's important um, in the context of everything that I care about. So I've I've come to yeah. understand it fairly well. But yeah. I, I do intend to try it out at some point. I have plans. Put it that way. But um, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a uh, that's excellent. So. Let's his other okay. So have we we didn't really maybe we should we explain more who Steiner was or sure sure we, we can go through it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it definitely he was an interesting character. Um, he was he was Austrian, not German. Yeah. A lot of people think he's German, but he wasn't like like someone else um, prominent <laughs> that we we won't <laughs> yeah. go into. Um, no. So he he was a polymath. Um, he basically attacked a vast array of subjects. Um, he was he was that really archetypal uh, 20th century genius type um so not bound by kind of hyper specialization he was is very much a, a renaissance man i guess with a huge breadth of knowledge um i think in his younger years he was he was uh, influenced by uh, goethe and uh, arthur schopenhauer and um a lot of his philosophy kind of was developed from there um i, I think Basically, today he's kind of seen as a philosopher, kind of social reformer, maybe an architect, and uh, probably foremost an esotericist, <clears throat> um, yeah. as uh, and an agriculturalist. Obviously, is what we've just been talking about. But um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think initially he was um, recognized um, as a literary critic, and he published uh, lots of philosophical works during this time. Um, including a book called The Philosophy of Freedom, which is one of his prominent works. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and what he's probably most famous for, was founding the spiritual movement Anthropos Anthroposophy, um, which I think he's probably best known for, right? Um, for those who don't know, Anthroposophy is kind of an outgrowth of the German idealist philosophical movement at the time. Um, it's also blended with theosophy. And it had other kind of influences like um, Goethean science and even Ro Rosicrucianism, which I wasn't aware of until recently. But he kind of synthesized all these things together. And uh, the reason he did that is because I, I'm led to believe that he thought there was a significant division between 
the arts and sciences and people's spiritual pursuits. And he really wanted to aim at pulling all these things together as forming, using these things as a foundation of a, a new way of seeing the world uh, effectively. And it's from this that uh, biodynamic agriculture sprung effectively, uh, along with some other things. Um, what I like about uh, Steiner is that he wasn't just sitting there in a library endlessly poring over books, uh, just having ideas about ideas about ideas like like many people at that time. He was very much putting his um, words into action. Yeah. And um, as, as you may know, you mentioned Waldorf schools. Uh, we had biodynamic farming. Uh, he had medicinal stuff, uh, curative education, uh, something called eurythmy, which is like a weird form of dancing. Um, or bodily movement as an art form. Yeah, okay. it's actually pretty okay. interesting if yeah. you check it out. Um, uh, there were no, sure numerous did, Christian so. communities that he set up. Uh, he was into right. architecture. So he had all these things, and his principles effectively formed the basis of these real-world applications, and the agriculture was one one element. Um, yeah. But I, what I like about the guy is he was a big-picture th thinker, and whatever you think about him, if you think it was nonsense, whatever it is, uh, you definitely can't criticize him for uh, for having this this uh, big picture style of thinking and this ability to synthesize all these things. Um, yeah, truly. And and uh, no, his powers of observation were. I haven't read that much Goethe, uh, so I don't know if he got it from that. But he had like even his opening, one of his opening chapters on um, one of his books. I like I have I haven't read the books. I listened to it like on YouTube or something. But it was a fascinating um, sort of scientific um slash esoteric um explanation of the seed i don't know if you ever read this no and like okay. how uh, portions of the seed how the the kernel of the seed is the beginning of is the beginning of chaos all the elements that lead to the creation of the seed are like order coming into motion and the seed itself is like chaos sprung free and part of it is sort of cosmic and related to the stars and the planets and the other part is sort of terran related to the earth and the soil yeah and i mean i can't do it justice talking trying to explain it but it was just yeah. Um, you could see it was like a vast open mind, like observing the world in a, yeah. in that kind of amazing, um, hyper intellectual slash naive way, you know, yeah. which is like, um, you know, perfect individual observation, let's say, but, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah so he's a, he's a, like you say, he's a polymath. I mean, all these things, and he was a man of action. So he did, he put it all into action and he tried it all. And he was, he was certainly, I believe he was directly played, um, corrected, uh, correct. And he made a. He made a, um, what do you call it? Not a prophecy, but a, uh, he said something, he, he was talking about bees, bee production, hmm. bee farming, whatever you call it. And um, around his time, they started making um, artificial queens. Do you know about this? Yeah, I do know about this. Yeah. Yeah, you know the story. Yeah. yeah. And he predicted, he said, okay, that's fine. He's like, someone asked him, what's going to happen from, from this? And he said, okay, you're going to have great production of, of honey for 60 years or something. And then it's going to, then it's going to go awry. And that's right around that time is when they started with the, um, the collapse, what do they call it? Um, the collapse thing that happens in the US where the hive collapse syndrome or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. he was right. <laughs> he predicted yeah. it like to the, to the decade. It's crazy, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have heard of that. Um, it is it is a serious problem. Um, I, I actually didn't know about it until recently. I find it amazing that you have artificial queens, but they've basically completely stuffed with the um, system that bees have. And I find that stunning, a stunning thing to try and do. But um, <laughs> it's a typical factory materialist yeah. way mm. of just like, oh, we, well, we need honey. Like, that's all they think yeah. about, you know, they don't, yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know, they don't think about the long term or anything. Yeah, 100 percent. Like, yeah. That, it, ever since that took over, that's that whole. Uh, I think, frankly, it was Evola put it one of the best. I don't know if you read him. A little bit. His yeah. described, he, was, he was comparing communism and the American capitalist system and saying how American capitalism is actually slightly worse because of the way it quantifies the world into this kind of factory hours and everything is like materialized to this point and that's really where it comes from i think it's like that hyper materialism it totally totally in ignorance of something like biodynamics where things are interrelated or let alone anything you can't even begin to think of anything like spiritual or mm. you know talking about the planets and, <laughs> and or even caring about something down the road past your own life like it's, you've told those bee guys 60 years it's going to collapse they're like well whatever we'll get 60 years of honey and you know all the bees maybe die but this is typical. I don't know what's, it's like the system. It's like, or the way Ted Kaczynski uh, talks about the system where the system itself is this entity that controls their minds and they can't, <laughs> they just have to obey. I don't know. Hmm. 
Yeah. But Steiner is the is the opposite. Steiner is the opposite of that kind of thing, and he's a man of solutions. If hmm. and, and, and that's why it's great to hear people in uh, Australia are doing uh, applying his methods to success. I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. And I think you know, interestingly, uh, I think people have kind of moved beyond him as well. So he put okay. principles down, but I think biodynamic farming, as far as I can tell, has you know developed significantly since that time oh, and it's it's, oh, okay, okay. it's another interesting thing it's kind of like a living knowledge and the farmer intuits the landscape and he, he learns things about his particular land and then he passes that on and so on and so forth you know it's like a living body of knowledge which is something that i consider you know very important um, so so he's, he has to think of the farm like a living organism in a way isn't that right 100 percent, yeah yeah you think about yeah. it like a living organism and and you're kind of almost like an artist you're you're um using these liminal processes uh, to read the landscape um, effectively. It's what I understand. Right. And, and the well, farmers, let's say, let's walk it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on, yeah. sorry. No, I was just going to say the farmer, you know, needs to, they, they can spend decades basically getting to know their land. And, and many yeah. farmers have told me that, you know, I'm only just now starting to get it and I'm going to retire in, you know, five years. So like, it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> element of things that, you know, you can spend your whole life, um, you know, trying yeah. to get your head around yeah. things and it's unfortunate because i think like what a big part of it is is you need a younger generation that are there to learn also and to receive that knowledge about that landscape but it's um yeah. Yeah. it's not really happening young people are not not interested in this in any way um so it's except for you except for me and i i live in a city so <laughs> what am i going to do you, you've got to start a culture you got to start a cult to yeah people. yeah i think i will yeah um yeah you should yeah yeah you get these you, you're a man of influence you can do it um maybe. so another thing you mentioned that i don't know what it is which maybe is related to precisely to what we're saying terrestrial biomes soil and how regent agriculture fits, fits in yeah yeah okay well it's something um yeah, I, I've been thinking about it a bit, and it ties in with regenerative agriculture and uh, biodynamic agriculture. Not explicitly, because it is a scientific notion, but we all know about the human microbiome. Um, we know, you know, what it's responsible for in the gut. We know all the behavioral and health um, consequences of it being in a dysbiotic state or in a bad state. I think most yeah. people are, are, are across that. I think that what people don't have a good understanding of is uh, the, the soil uh, also has this. So the, the terrestrial biome uh, has has a huge bacterial mass that lives in it. Yeah. Uh, and I think recently scientists have come out with this concept uh, called a holobiont. And what a holobiont is, it's, it's kind of reimagining of the human organism and all the organisms on the planet uh, to also include the microbiota as part of the organism, as a single selective unit, so to speak. So mm -hmm. in a way, they're acknowledging that we have the uh, human genome, but we also have the genome of the microbiota, and they all form uh, basically one superorganism. And this superorganism is called the holobiont. Um, mm. So basically, okay. it's, it's, it's a concept that's it's right at the edge still, but it's emerged over the last couple of years. And um, it, it basically, we're kind of like a lumbering system and, and we interact with the microbiota around us and the soil within us all around the place. And interestingly, um, within this superorganism, there are actually uh, gene transfers that go on amongst us and the microbiota and also okay. so so they're called what what's called a horizontal gene transfer which means that what you have in your gut which by extension is probably from what you consume and and what you've been around your whole life uh, yeah. passes on genes and it can literally change the genotype of the human being and over time um through lateral um gene transfer which is obviously passing what you pass on to your children and stuff like that is you can actually have um changes to the phenotype from this horizontal gene transfer of the microbiota in the soil which is pretty okay. crazy when you think about it so what that means basically is that microbiota are shaping 
human evolution to a large degree. And so how do we shave it back in return? It's when we, uh, when we uh, create waste in our compost and our sewage, uh, it goes back into the soil, is that? Yeah, how precisely. It's, uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, it's, it's complicated. I don't pretend to understand the exact mechanisms, but it's very much right. a two-way street. So you can think about it, that the genes are interacting. So, so the microbiota are interacting on us. The environment is interacting on us and the microbiota. And the reverse mm -hmm. is the case also. So it's a very symbiotic dynamic relationship <clears throat> so um so that's that's a terrestrial biome you would say well a terrestrial biome refers more to plant life and animal life and and uh and, oh, okay. you know the, the aquatic environment for example but within the terrestrial biome you have the microbiome of these terrestrial biomes and right. this is okay. where we're getting this notion of um the holo biome <clears throat> right. so pardon me so um one example of this that you might find interesting is the Japanese digestive system has, and, and this is one of the examples that they've used to verify this theory, is that okay. um, the Japanese famous for consuming uh, algae, well, seaweed. Um, yep. Over time, uh, one of the bacteria on the seaweed uh, has done a horizontal gene transfer at some point. And as a result, the digestive system of Japanese people in general has changed. So that's yeah. one way that the biota in the soil can actually change the physical phenotype of a population over time. Yeah. So I guess the point of me saying all this is that with monoculture and stuff like that, what you're effectively doing is you're destroying the microbiota in the soil. You're putting... It's kind of like having a screwed up gut as a human. It's exactly the same in the soil. The soil, in a way, is a bit like a stomach. <laughs> if you think about it that way, right? It's, it's, kind yeah, of like, yeah, it's yeah. full of bacteria. Uh, you're meant to have a, a big diversity of bacteria. It's kind of, it's kind of digesting things in its own way. 100%. And, um, you know, the bacteria that live there um, are very dependent on the landscape and, you know, where it is. And that's a very yeah. individual thing as well. So you can envisage a situation in which tribes of humans that lived in a certain place over time their evolution is very much tied up with the type of bacteria and the type of microbiota that are in that environment in which they lived for a long time and they played yeah. a very important role in the selection of human beings over time and i think yeah. one of the biggest problems with monoculture that we're going to face and something that no one's talking about is besides the soil quality problem and soil just not existing anymore is actually the dysbiosis of the microbiota in the soil. What so does that mean, dysbiosis? So dysbiosis refers to an, an imbalance, essentially, of bacteria. And, and oh. usually you refer to your gut. If someone has a gut problem, if you have too many of one phyla of bacteria, um, mm -hmm. for example, in, in humans, you can have, you have two main types of phyla. You have one called... Uh, the Firmicutes phyla, and then you have another one called Bacteria dites. Um, because of the Western diet, for example, people tend to have a lot of Firmicutes, which are sugar-feeding bacteria. Mm -hmm. And if you have a bad diet and you have too many of these kinds of bugs in your gut, it can lead to all sorts of physical problems in your gut. And what this is referred to as is dysbiosis. This is what okay. dysbiosis is. And I'm just applying that label to the soil because what we've seen with monoculture is that it can lead to a basically a destruction of the diversity of the bacteria within an environment. And uh, what I'm getting at, I guess, in general is that if this continues to be the case and we continue to create a dysbiosis of bacteria in the soil, we're literally screwing with the mechanisms of natural selection effectively yeah 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 and, and this so is the mono, yeah, yeah. So, okay so, yeah. i was just going to say and over time you can imagine the the problems we're going to experience not just health problems but literally maybe a lessening of the human being or a, oh or a, i'd say we're we've already been lessened to be honest yeah, um yeah in the most part but like it, yeah definitely you're right monoculture see when i think of monoculture and like the corporate way of doing things it, in a, it applies to both agriculture and architecture and other things Steiner was in, uh, interested in. It's like we're creating a, in our pursuit for um, safety and 
permanence and cycles like we can't stand to have a crop fail and like miss out on anything so everything must flow along you know the, the, the shells must be stocked or whatever yeah. the we are creating like a false imitation of what the thing is supposed to be like even life itself is supposed to be it's like modern architecture is like it doesn't really fulfill the purpose of true architecture mm. it's like a false it's missing everything important let's say but it's like fulfills like the basic sort of practical needs but it like it's like a, it's like a negative false world <laughs> where there's no life or soul to anything mm. and it's mundane and unchanging and kind of dead and dead is really what it is it's like a it's like a dead imitation of the real thing we're kind of into this dead mimicry and I would say that's maybe the same where we're even as ourselves, our own bodies and our food, food cycle, food process is also becoming like an, an imitation of what it should be and is also kind of dead. It's kind of going through the motions, but the important part is missing. And if, Absolutely, yeah. if it doesn't break somehow, it will break. It's got to break, I figure, because I don't know, how can it, how can it persist? Or at least it'll change in some extraordinary, extraordinary other new way. That's how evolution works, probably. Yeah. It'll either break and we'll all die or some mini disaster will alter it i don't know but anyways that's i think that's what we're doing we're not everything is like a false imitation yeah. which maybe sounds weird but yeah. yeah no i know i know what you're saying <clears throat> absolutely pardon me it's um yeah everything is being brought to its um most basic part uh, in a mechanistic way um and we're, we're unfortunately we're missing the point because we're we're only focusing on one little part of an entire picture and because we're missing yeah. the entire picture we we're making bad choices and decisions i think it's the same thing with medicine right like if you go and see a doctor um you know and, and i don't know you've got a problem with your let's just keep it at the gut you have a problem with the gut but it's creating other problems in your in your body maybe you're depressed as a result right yeah. which, we, which we know happens so if you have a gut problem it can affect your mood and the way that you see things so what the doctor will do is he'll send you to a, a shrink the shrink's going to give you drugs um that work specifically on the brain because that's what that sh that guy has been trained to do he's just focusing on the yeah. brain that's where depression comes from it comes from the brain yeah. that's what we're going to focus on xanax or whatever 100 percent. and uh, but he's not going to look at okay well maybe i need to look at the totality of this system as a human being, like, what is it? What's wrong with this guy? Should I look at his gut? Maybe he has a, a gut problem. Maybe he has a parasite. Could be anything. Yeah. Um, um, but we don't look at things that way. And I think the same psychology applies, you know, as you say, to architecture, to farming, to all these things. We don't look at the entire picture. We just look at these constituent paths. And everyone lacks the ability, um, you know, and as we said, Steiner had that ability, but everyone lacks the ability to see the bigger picture. And I think that's a massive... Well, not That's not everyone, but yeah, what we lose it more and more. Or do we do? I don't know. Do are more people becoming aware, or are there more people just losing the ability to to stand up to try to change it? I don't know. I, don't I can't know. tell. Yeah, I'm not sure either. It's hard, um, it's hard to think. In, in my day to day life, up. like I don't see really anyone that is becoming more aware. Although, like if you hang around our circles, maybe online, you would like to think so, right? But yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can find like easy agreement, like say, like who would watch this video, let's say, and be outraged in disagreement, uh, who's not a, like a total, you know, sort of system cuck, you know, a guy who owns a fleet of trucks delivering a ham, <laughs> or something, you know, something, something like that. I mean, most people would be like, yeah, you know, it's, it's at least partially mostly true. Yeah. I mean, it is completely true, obviously. But let, let's get into the more difficult part then at this point, because let's talk about the liminal elements in farming, the spiritual. Um spiritual elements in biodynamic farming hmm. and farming in the past. What do you, <clears throat> what can we say about that? Um, well, I think, you know, I just, I guess I just wanted to briefly comment on. Oh, sorry. Sowing by the moon and the stars and things, things like that. I mean, um, yeah. So, so uh, recently uh, there's a former monk online that I did a podcast with, uh, the venerable Panyo Basa. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, um, he, he used to be a Theravadan monk. Um, okay. and he recently disrobed, but anyway, uh, we had a conversation once and in that he discussed a book called the trickster and the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And it's a great book. I recommend everyone reads it. It's fantastic. But in that book, it talks about shamans and, and people like this, um, who basically live on the edge of reality. So you have a consensus reality that everyone lives in, which we could say mm -hmm. in our case is 
you know, the reality of corporations and science and, you know, the general cuckery, as you say. Um, yeah. And then on the other hand, you have biodynamic agriculture, which kind of would be represented a bit by, you know, like a shaman, which is, it brings a liminal element into a process. So you discard the rules that everyone has, and then you bring in something that seems a little bit kooky. So in a shaman's mm-hmm. case, you, you, you'll have the tribe going around doing the tribe stuff. Then the shaman, you know, is over there banging on a drum outside of the rules. And as a result, yeah. that gives him access to certain, I guess you say powers, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I was just thinking, I was throwing this idea around that maybe some of the power um, that biodynamics has is actually taking advantage of this liminal element of reality. Uh, so it's kind of like, okay, we know that this is what science does. This is what uh, monoculture does. This is These are the rules, but, you know, fuck that. I'm going to go and start sowing seeds to the moon and the stars because it's like outside of the rules. And I often wondered, yeah. scientifically, it seems absurd. Like, why is this going to work? It doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all, right? Like when I when yeah. I look at it, I look at a sowing, sowing chart and I'm like, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> but the more I think about it in the context of this book, I often, I often wonder, is this what it is? Is it some kind of liminal process that goes beyond rationality? And that's why mm-hmm. people do have success with it. I don't know what you think about that. That's kind of just well, I totally, I'm, I'm always for, I am not opposed to spiritual answers to things uh, by any means. And <laughs> But um, I mean, even if you want to be purely rational, to be as rational as you can about it, you know, so much of what we do and what animals do is instinctual and intuitive already. And you take certain things for many things for granted you see in the animal kingdom or that humans do and just say, oh, that's instinct, you know, but like, what does that really, like, what does that mean? Like when a bird knows exactly what to do and when, or like those stories of, do- like the story of a dog that got, uh, the owners uh, drove from either the middle of America or even possibly the East Coast to California for a holiday. I think it was probably from the middle. I, don't, I can't remember. And like left the dog there somehow and drove back and uh like you know figured they lost the dog and then i I think i don't know if it was years later whatever the dog shows up Mm. and it's like okay you know how did the dog do that Mm. Mm. (laughs) and it's like i think like a shaman is someone you turn to not to be irrational but his answers are going to be you're looking for someone who's in tune or intuitive as people can be in those unexplainable ways those funny stories here people can predict what the weather's going to do or this and that you know I think he's doing his best to get in tune with whatever weird energies are at work in nature that which we can't fathom anyways to intuit something uh, irrational that you know you can you can still count on mm. is the best way I can put it maybe mm-hmm, mm-hmm. hopefully hopefully that makes some remote mm-hmm. sense what I'm babbling about <laughs> right. yeah it does I think it, you know essentially we're saying the same thing um, yeah yeah I've thought about it a lot. Um, because, you know, obviously as a Westerner, I have a sensibility where a lot of the stuff seems crazy to me. But <clears throat> again, mm-hmm. talking to the farmers, they all swear by it. So, um, yeah. yeah. Isn't that like divining? Divining seems to work a lot of the time I read. Yeah. With the rod yeah. looking for water. Is, is that, yeah, yeah. yeah. You ever hear that? Yeah. I, ha- I have heard that. I actually did it once with someone. Um, did you? Yeah. I, I couldn't get it to work, but he, he could. Yeah. But again, one of those funny things, right? Like, um, you know, I've heard stories that, yeah, people can divine water. In Australia, that's a big thing. They used to have water diviners, you know, all around the place. But yeah, I've heard other people say it's bollocks. I mean, I don't really know, but, um, you know, it could be. Well, I, could yeah, be you just things, picture, you know? someone, picture someone who's in nature a lot and is in tune with all the various little uh, biodynamic kind of hints you might get, you know, mm-hmm. as well as just going with a flow of intuition, like a current is passing through the world and you you know, try to intuit these energies that are where life forces and things, I guess, that are unexplainable and not on the surface. And to do that, you have to be kind of kooky and just kind of like <laughs> meditate. I mean, I'm not good at it myself. I don't do, I don't, I'm not a shaman, but no, neither. I just try to think about it because it seems to be um, like the scientific answer to everything goes in one direction and it's not necessarily the truth. It's more like its own truth. It's the scientific truth. Hmm. And as we can see, it leads to stagnation. It's it can be anti-life, not always. Yeah. I think science, when it's merged with culture and this kind of it kept into in a in a, in its own biome of um, culture and religion and 
you know, stuff like this, that's when science is best served. And that's really where it comes from anyways. When you take it out and try to use it as its own thing alone, it just seems to become a system thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, but yeah. It's, it's just um, a tool, right? Like it's, um, I, I think even yeah. in the 19th century, m most of those guys uh, call it natural philosophy. And what they did was yeah. they just saw it as me finding out about God's creation. Like that's kind of in its purest form what it was. Yeah. And you, we have this force of... Uh, scientism now that's become a religion of its own mm -hmm. and um you know it's uh, a little bit funny it's a belief system now it's, it's yeah it, defend, it defends its own beliefs with irrationality it will it will actually lie about facts to defend its own belief yeah now yeah, it often does yeah. right absolutely yeah, yeah. Hmm. it's overly negative beliefs which are like what nothing yeah but um i was gonna ask too what's the so what would what would you consider the difference between this view to agriculture and like the more popular sort of just organic farming and stuff uh, well, the, the difference, as far as I can tell, is this liminal element, and right. that's the spiritual side of things that people so, are into. Right. Yeah. So, pra practically, practically speaking, there's no other, you know, like you read about, um, there's no dig and stuff like that. Sorry, yeah. Does that there is that as well? So there is there is the element of no dig, and one thing we didn't talk about with the preparations, um, mm. and, and uh, we we can briefly go through that, but effectively in biodynamic agriculture specifically they use these things called preparations and i i think we went to, went through it briefly but what that is is uh they have these number designations so you, you'll hear think something like preparation 500 pre preparation 501 um and i think there are others basically it goes from 500 to 507 um, but, but what they are, um, are substances, um, they have a recipe, they have various herbs, uh, manure, stuff like that, and they're prepared in a very specific way. And each preparation has a, has a focus or a purpose. Um, you have compost preparations that mm -hmm. um, basically if you want a certain outcome, you'll use a certain preparation on the compost. And okay. on the other hand, you have the biodynamic preparations, which are probably the most famous ones. There's a preparation called 500, which is pretty much the, I would say the, the bee's knees of the biodynamic preparations. And okay. they, they consider this, the farmers consider this the most powerful substance on the earth. And, the, and what they okay. use it for is to develop uh, soil microbial activity and to build soil up. And what's interesting about it is, um, they take some of the uh, compost that they've used, that they've prepared through a very amusing mean, which is that you get cow horns and you put uh, soil inside the cow horn and you bury it and you leave it there for about a year or something like that. Then you take right. this substance and then you mix it up with all this other stuff and you mix it up in a very specific way. You can't hit the sides of the container I think you have to mix it clockwise and you have to do it for like an hour or something like that. Yeah, cool, you, yeah. you only use a very small amount of this, this soil and you throw yeah. it in and uh, basically you just go around your farm and you just spray this stuff. And it's kind of like homeopathy a little bit. They're using just a minuscule amount of, of this soil. And again, yeah. it's one of these things I was initially skeptical of. But yeah. yeah, talking to these guys, like they swear by this stuff, man. Like they just think it's just amazing. And I, this right. one farmer in particular, I went to his farm and he um, showed me uh, at the, the barrier of his farm and the farm next door, effectively. And he showed me the soil difference in the height of the topsoil. Yeah. And he had at least, I would say, 10 to 15 centimeters at the edge compared to the paddock next door and he purely puts this down to the use of 500 as a preparation right so and do they um do they make it themselves when they do this or do they buy it from somebody you, you can buy it um, i think i think there's several right. places that sell it yeah so you don't have to make it yourself um you do have to mix it yourself but you don't have to make it yourself um they actually have quite quite large industrial scale mixes i believe i've seen them online Right. But um, anyway, that's one thing that yeah. separates it. The other thing that separates yeah. it, as we've spoken about, of course, sowing to the moon and stars, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah. it's probably these elements primarily that um, are, are really different. Are different, yeah. yeah. So it's otherwise it's otherwise similar, but it has that, the, that extra 
the extra liminal elements, as you say. Yeah. So that's interesting. All right. Yeah. And I do, and they, they do put a lot of emphasis, I believe, on cow manure. I think it was, I think I read something from Steiner where he was saying the cow, the purpose of the cow on the farm is to provide manure, like first and yeah. foremost. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe that, maybe more farmers just think that, know that, think that anyways, and I'm, I'm not a farmer either. I don't know. Yeah. Look, but, he, uh, he was big on, on people using the wrong, uh, compost for the wrong purpose. And as you say, yeah, he was big on cow manure. But cow manure um, composted in a very specific way. So, right. um, yeah, if you go online, you look it up, you can see like people packing manure into horns and then putting it underground. It's quite bizarre. Oh, is it, oh is it, so they put the manure, it's manure they put in the horns. I, I'm pretty sure it's manure. manure. I'm pretty sure. And then they oh, use right. that manure to make the 500. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, well, I might have to try this. I might have to try this. You know, you can get kits online. You should try. Just give it a go. I will try. Yeah. Because yeah. I make. I'm just finishing a, a fairly large greenhouse, and I want to make try and grow like very specific things in it. But I'd like to get some. Yeah. Some choice soil going for that. Yeah. Great. So give I will. Go. Let me know how it goes. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I will for sure. Yeah. Um. So what about what else have we got here? So now, uh, liminal elements is implications of biomes and implications of super or, or okay. We think we talked about that. Yeah. Or did we? Oh, implications of superorganisms. Did we talk about that? Um, pretty, pretty much. Yeah, I think we did. I mean, that's this whole notion that we we are a superorganism. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. Okay, and this is the really, really out there part of uh, of what you want to talk about is how we view ourselves, what the self is, and the work of the no self. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so what? Yeah, people may be wondering how this ties in, but I, I think it does, and it, and it ties okay. into. Cool this notion of the holo biont. So when, the way that we're starting to see ourselves uh, as these uh, super organisms that have all these elements to them that uh, are not under our control as such, right? Mm. You, you don't really yeah. have control over bacteria. You don't know what they're up to. They probably have their own you know, things that they're up to. What are they up to? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I got no idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, another thing that I've, I've been working on recently and I've uh, don't know if people who know me, all the two individuals who listen to my podcast would know that I have. Um, hey, I listen to it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, the other one. <laughs> three, three, uh, yeah. three um, would know that I, I have an interest in Buddhism. Um, I, I practice uh, Zen. I practice meditation uh, regularly. And, and this has led to certain realizations, I would say, about the, the nature of the self. And, um, what, what I call this is, well, not, not what I call it, but it's really called the, the nature, or oh, sorry, the, the work of the no self. And what this is, is, is through meditation, through um, dialectic, we can come to realize that essentially the self is uh, very much illusory. Um, it's an illusory thing. And what I like about uh, the agricultural element here that we've gone through today is it offers a context to show us that in many ways we are an organism that is a part of a greater whole. There are forces outside of us that shape who we are, that shape the way that we act in the world, uh, whether it's our parents, the environment that we're brought up in, the food that we eat, the, you know, the, the, the weird twists of fate that shape us. In some sense, we don't really do anything. We are just a product of what occurs around us, and we're a part of this system. I think the modern person often sees themselves as outside of everything. Like we mm -hmm. possess a free will, for example. People have this notion of free will, uh, yeah. which I think is absurd. And I think... Um, a lot, a lot of uh, people have spoken about this. I think Sam Harris, who's someone that I otherwise am greatly annoyed by, um, <laughs> did did excellent work on why free will is ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, he did I, a few good things. Yeah, he did a few good things. Yeah, yeah. Despite, and, despite himself, he did he had a couple of things that went he, he did, yeah, despite himself. Yeah. And actually, in a way, yeah. he, he stole the free will thing from Buddhism anyway, the way that he talks about it. It's just the Buddhist right. way of talking about it. But anyway. I, I've, I've gone out to my Christian brothers online and I've challenged them to offer me, you know, a coherent argument as to why free will is, is real in any way. But um, so far, nothing. So far, it's just been a load of bollocks. Um, nothing is convincing. 
And, you know, the challenge is still out there. I mean, everything they sent me is a lot of gobbledygook. But the, the implication of there being no free will is, of course, that the notion we have of ourself controlling everything is also illusory. And I yeah. understand this to be the case because I've had these experiences and I've gone through this process with other people, this dialectical and meditational process. So the work that I'm really involved in at the moment is putting together a meditation suite and a kind of course for people that would like to undergo this process of essentially seeing the illusion for what it is, which is entirely possible. Um, okay. Now, what I, what I like about the agricultural element is, is that it really reinforces this view of why free will is silly. And I think a lot of what's wrong with farming and a lot of what's, what's wrong with the way that we view things is that we do consider ourselves separate from everything else. So when we abuse the landscape and we ab abuse fertilizers and we, we have these attitudes towards um, these real mechanistic attitudes towards the landscape, I think that in many ways, it's a direct result of this illusion of a separate self, this illusion yeah. of being able to impose some kind of will on something as if we're living outside of it, right? We're not a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Where if we're a biome and we're in uh, biodynamic and relating to it, it's just part, we are just an element in it. Exactly. Although we are a, we are a powerful element. Obviously we're a powerful element where we can do the things we're doing, even though it's going to end up biting us back and the rest of them will punish us. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but, but nonetheless, yeah. we are an element where, and we're only one element. And, for sure, we're yeah. we're powerful, but by the same token, you could say that the bacteria are powerful. You know, they oh, they yeah. are right; they totally are. Yeah. As we've gone through, yeah. So anyway, um, basically, I just wanted to basically talk about that a little bit. Um, that no, you know, I, yeah. I have this stuff going on, and and one of the things I'm working on that people may be interested in in the future is basically a full meditational course and a full suite of the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. Um, that's going to be it's basically called the great frames of reference in Buddhism. And what this is, is a process of, of meditation and mindfulness. And I'm going to be putting something together in this vein, um, as well as the dialectical work of, of the no self that people that want to go undergo this process uh, can do so in, in a fairly easy and accessible way. Um, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it for sure. Well, you could you could be my first victim. Yeah, we can we can try it out <laughs> yeah. and we can, we can yeah. go through that. Absolutely, if sure. if you want to do it, I'd be more yeah, than do, happy. Yeah. You could you could you could be the test subject. I like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that that's coming out soon, and okay. um, basically, I just wanted to mention it because I I feel like when you go through uh, all these things that we've been speaking about, the influence of the microbiome, the influence of the dynamic systems in the earth, the fact that we're a part of everything. It just really goes to reinforce this notion that we can't really treat ourselves as separate anymore. We need to start looking at things like there's no barriers. It's kind of like a massive onion and we're one layer of it. And I think that when people start to get this through their heads, uh, things can start to get a little bit better. Um, so that's my yeah, it's very hard though. It is very hard. And especially in that kind of, it's not even Christian anymore. It's more like the post-Christian worldview. It's very atomized. It's very like individualistic. Faux, it's not even true individualism. It's like a faux indi individualism. Yeah. In yeah. that fake, fake way, the the fake world. But um, yeah, it's very hard. But uh, many are seeking answers. So um, you know, you never know what can, how many you, you people you can save. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> enough. Just enough. I mean, yeah, and, you know, it's it's kind of a simple realization in a, in a way, and it's it's quite liberating. Obviously, once you have it, because you ironically. Yeah. When you realize you have no free will, things open up. That's all I can say. It's um, yeah, quite bizarre like that. But, um, yeah, yeah. I had a talk with a Platonist about this, and we, that was our conclusion as well. Yeah. Although that the entire first hour of the talk was, uh, we I did like what we're, what we're doing, but I actually forgot to press record. Yeah. And we just talked <laughs> and just like lost right. the whole thing, and we like argued about this, and we came to the conclusion, yeah, there's no free will. And that was between us, and uh, yeah. And then the next one, we just talked about talk for an hour again, like the next week about how there's no free will. Right. right. It's all de destiny. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is destiny. Yeah, you may as well call it fate and destiny. You know, yeah, I, I mean, agree. It's interesting. It's, it's kind of like um, you look at the ancient ancient um, 
you know, uh, religions, the pagan religions, how they had this notion that um, the gods were just playing with you, and you know, you had a great fate or you had a, you know, a pauper's fate, whatever it is. But they, yeah. you think they recognize on some level that they didn't really have free will. It's just kind of at the yeah. whim. And I, whim I, the gods. I would encourage anybody who hasn't to try a bit of gardening, even if it's like on a very minor scale. That getting your hands in the dirt and um, successfully growing a few things and eating them if you can yeah. is very um, how do I say uh, it's it, it gives you a feeling of wisdom and understanding that you may not have had if you didn't. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and yeah. farming has got a it's had a, a tough run amongst some Twitter circles. I think some people mm -hmm. have viewed it as a form of escapism. You know, like going to homestead yeah. and not bothering with society is kind of like viewed as a bad thing in oh. some way. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think it's nonsense, um, to be blunt. I think yeah. that being a farmer is obviously very noble work. And last time I checked, um, you know, these, these people are going to the shop consuming food. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing. So, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. this is important work. And for young yeah. people in particular who have heard this and it kind of sinks to them a little bit uh look into it go and do it i think it's an important thing that people need to do for the yeah it is the most important that's what steiner would have said is the most important really the connection agriculture comes first it's everything all other culture um comes out from that same from that point it radiates out from that point yeah yeah really absolutely it does absolutely yeah yeah okay so that was good what do you think well that was about an hour or so yeah no plenty i'm uh about to there's anything else to so yeah let's know when you've got your uh when you've got your course or whatever you're calling it and uh um we'll do another one on uh, on that and we'll make another video about it i guess yeah whatever you want. definitely yeah well, that was good so. what, what i'll do is um yeah i'll put it together and maybe in the next couple of weeks i'll get in contact and uh, the, the way that i like to do it the dialectical element yeah which is the most important element is basically through an email correspondence and okay. um that's all you need to do and uh yeah we can go through it and uh sure. yeah you see what see what you think um, okay well yeah. i'm gonna end the recording and then we'll talk for a few more minutes and yeah, then cool. uh that'll be it all right sounds good okay goodbye